And even it's funny, like, I think it was like two or three months ago, I, I read Netscape daily, and um, it came across my desk. It said, Doctor, you better be on board because one in seven of your patients is already taking it. So I thought that was really interesting. They're taking it anyway. So we want to be we want to be a doctor that's like, yeah, tell me what you're taking. Because now it's funny, my patients that um, now that I'm doing CBD, they're like, oh, now I can tell you, I take THC too. You know, like it's almost like allowing people to speak like about the things that they're taking. Because how many times does a patient come in and then they don't really disclose what they're on because they're embarrassed. Or they they feel like oh you're we're going to be very judgmental. Yeah, there's still, even there's still a huge stigma associated with it, and I think it's really important um, being the only non doctor in the room, uh, you know that that you guys you know become you know educated in this. Even if you're not advocates for cannabis, I think it's really important that medical professionals become educated because the problem I see not from the medical side is. You know, um, Dr. Sam in New Jersey, they just legalized um, marijuana there. But you have all these states where essentially it's politicians that are determining, you know, laws and regulations who 99% of them have no medical training whatsoever. So they don't understand how to treat a patient. They've never treated a patient before. Um, they don't understand how the body works or the systems works, let alone do they actually understand cannabis. But these are the people that are determining how you can treat your patients and, and um, me personally, I have a big problem with that. I think, um, you know, the decision to use, whether it's cannabis, you know, uh, marijuana or CBD should be between a patient and their doctor. And that's it. Um, you're, you're, you're the expert, you're their, you're their advocate. And so I think it's really important as more and more doctors become educated that we take this power kind of out of the hands of local and state politicians and really put it into your hands to determine but, what's best. Grand, yeah, but, right? but to determine what's best for you. But that's the problem is like what what we want to fulfill is that you're the doctor's like, uh, I don't know, did you get it at seven eleven? Is it something because what we have right. found is there are heavy metals and pesticides within a lot of these C B D products that you're just buying on whatever and don't buy C B D on Amazon by the way, because it's not it's not what it says it is. So it's, yeah, it's so something like, completely different. If, if yeah. we go if we go back to two thousand and eighteen when we opened up our brick and mortar store, what's different about our store is one, we're not a franchise, so we don't sell franchise products. We decided, hey, let's go out there and see who's doing it the best in the country. Let's bring those products here. Um, you know, they're not in glass cases, it doesn't have this, you know, kind of sketchy smoke shop feel. It's this bright educational experience. But we went a step further and we said, you know, we're going to run lab tests on these products independently. So if you're a brand and you approach our store, you're going to provide us with a lab report that says what's in your product. Well, we went a step further and we said, well, we're going to independently lab test it ourselves. And then when we put these lab reports together, they should match up and say the same thing. And what we found was that, um, you know, there was a, a huge margin that didn't. Um, and so, yeah, we found lead, we found arsenic. Um, we found we found products that were mislabeled that you know said there was a thousand milligrams and there was five hundred. We found products that literally were coconut oil with a label CBD label on it. Um, it was white label. And, and, and what yeah. and what we found was there's really no one to tell them that they can't do that. And so it's really incumbent not only on the provider. Um, but the, the consumer as well to be really educated on what brand they're buying, you know, where is the hemp sourced, how is it manufactured, you know, how does it wind up on your shelf, what are those processes that it goes through. And, and, and I think it was Sam, which Sam said it earlier, you said we, we all, as a physician, our standards are naturally higher. They just operate right. higher. And that is, yep. it, it's just, it, that's just like, yeah, of course I'm going to make it where it does have pesticide in it. I don't want to take it with pesticide. So I have an invested interest in it because I'm giving it to my own patients. So my standard is always going to be above some guy that made it out of his apartment, obviously, because, like, you know, my name is on it. And I, I really want it to help people because, I, I mean, it's got my name on it, right? So. Yeah, yeah. Well, so WellCell was really born, yeah, WellCell was born again out of this solution. So... Lisa got into CBD, needing a solution for her patients. We got into CBD. We found these problems in the market. And so WellSo was really, again, born out of another need for a solution to deliver a product that had the, you know, the safety, the consistency, and the efficacy that she was used to on the medical side. 
And so, so how do you source your product and how do you manufacture it as well sell? So what, what is it that you do that's better or different than, say, what's out there now? I mean, wh- your, your sources. Like, how did you get, go about that? So, and, and I'll kind of frame it in the way of what a consumer should look for when they purchase a product. So one, it's, it's very important that they source a product that uses American-grown hemp. There's a huge influx in the market of foreign hemp. And hemp is a great plant because you plant it in the ground, it grows very quickly, and it also soaks up any contaminants. And so, you know, if there's a chemical spill, you can plant hemp over that, and it's going to suck all that stuff out of the soil, and you can begin to reuse that soil. Now, in other countries, sometimes they don't really care. Do they use that to clean up a toxic spill, and then they just sell it on the market? And so that's where you start finding these CBD products here in the U.S. that have these high metal concentrations in them. So you want to make sure that it's American grown hemp grown to organic standards. So there, there is a little bit of confusion on being USDA certified and it's still kind of a gray area right now in the market, but at least grown to organic standards. Um, you want to make sure that it's extracted using, um, one of the, one of the more beneficial techniques. So, um, we use a CO2 extraction because it's one of the cleanest ways to extract it. And then finally, how do you manufacture it? So WellCell is manufactured in a uh, certified GMP facility. So it is controlled by the FDA and how it's manufactured and and the quality standards that go along with it. And so you really wanna make sure as a consumer that the product you're buying, all those steps are controlled along the way. And one of the problems in the market, she mentioned the white labeling is probably about 75% of the products on the market Um, are only made by a handful of manufacturers. And so they sell their house product. I decide I want to be a CBD brand. I just buy their product. I slap my label on it and Mm -hmm. sell it as if I created it. And so um, we're a little bit different and our formulation is 100% proprietary. Lisa developed it with some pretty amazing chemists and manufacturers. And so what we do is not only use that super high quality CBD, American grown hemp, um, she has infused it with high quality organic bioceuticals like turmeric, ginger, and peppermint that have their own wellness properties that are well documented. Um, and so we really believe combining all those together in this proprietary formula um, really kind of raises the bar for us. And then we do batch level testing, which is different. And so again, if you're a consumer buying a product anywhere, you want to make sure that there's batch level testing. And what that means is every time we make a product batch, that batch is individually tested as a final product. What a lot of people do is they run a lab report because lab testing is very expensive. It's six, $700 to test a product. And so that a lot of people, what they do is they test a product and they use that same lab report for the next, Everything. for the next five, six batches, whatever. And so we're different that every batch is lab tested. Um, every product, I don't know if you can see that has a QRC code on it. So you can scan any one of our products and be taken directly to the lab report that's associated with your product. And we do full panel, so we're going to test for potency. We test for heavy metals, molds, solvents, um, you know, the full range. And so, again, as the consumer, we're giving you the power to see what's actually in your your product and not just some general, you know, lab report that got done. You know, and and at the end of the day, we all know with everything that we use, whether it's on our body, who we go to for surgeon, whatever, whatever, transparency is everything. And I think yeah. that's how we build, I, I know that's how I built my career, is I've been honest about everything, what I've done, what I do, who I see, you know, just being honest. And it, it honesty is the best policy cliche, does really matter. Yeah. And so that's what I think is important as surgeons, it's you have to be honest with your patients. I, we, we full disclosure everybody right when they come in the door. And so I've used all of that information from my past and what I've learned as a doc and doing surgery on people too is be honest with people. And so that's translated over to my new business with Trey. It's the same thing. Yeah. We're just extremely transparent. And that's what that's how you become successful. I love it. Well, I, I have one question that is um, not directly related to surgery, but literally I think three times a week I hear an advertisement on the radio for Delta 8. What is Delta 8? Like you, I heard Trey mention Delta nine in the very beginning. What's Delta eight and why has it become such a thing recently? All right. So, well, Delta nine is your traditional THC molecule. Uh, and mm-hmm. Delta nine is the only cannabinoid 
mentioned in the hemp bill in Texas and the U.S. with a limit on it. So again, it's at three tenths of one percent of Delta Nine. Um, that's that's the most you can have. Now Delta Eight is a close cousin to Delta Nine, just slightly different in molecular structure. And what they found is in a natural setting, Delta Eight does not get you high. But if they take Delta Eight and they concentrate it it does give a slightly high feeling. Not as strong as Delta-9, but it is psychoactive. And so Delta-8 has become kind of this legal workaround for THC in Texas, because again, as long as it's not Delta-9, um, you're okay. And so Delta-8 has become this kind of legal THC workaround in Texas. However, um, there's a couple uh, medical marijuana bills in the Texas legislature right now and I think it was Friday night, uh, a senator uh, inserted an amendment into a medical marijuana reform bill to ban Delta-8 in Texas. Um, and now it's gonna go so to the floor. So, so to legalize medical marijuana, but ban Delta-8? Is that what this bill is? Uh, well, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of special interests involved in this decision. Um, it wasn't probably done in the right way. It was done kind of the last minute at the end of the night, they threw something in. Uh, but, but yeah, and so you also have Delta-8 and now you're seeing Delta-10 emerge, um, which is another um, cannabinoid found in the hemp plant that's just slightly different in molecular structure than Delta-9. And it has its own psychoactive effects that are different than Delta-8 and Delta-9 too. And so, you know, in Texas for hemp farmers, hemp producers, Delta-8 and Delta-10 potentially are, you know, large sources of revenue for them. And so, uh, Within Texas, I know there's probably people listening all over. Within Texas, you're going to see Delta 8 and Delta 10 become a really hot topic in the next two weeks as it goes to the House floor to talk about. But again, I think it's another way to show that, that everybody, that people are looking for alternatives. Yeah. They're desperate. They don't want to be on Ambien. They don't want to feel, yeah, Ambien's terrible. It, may, it alters your brain, it, no way worse than, than like a Delta 8 or a Delta 10 potentially would. Um, you can still function on Delta 8, but not like THC Delta 9. So but like the Ambience right. of the world, the Lexapros, all the meds and the meds and the meds and the meds, Xanax and all that kind of stuff, it's way better than that kind of stuff. So again, we don't love that politicians are deciding what patients are trying to do for their own benefit to sleep. Look at the anxiety and everything else that's come out of 2020. We have more depression than we've ever seen. The biggest cause of disability in the world, in the world, is anxiety and depression. That is the wow. biggest reason that people seek disability from their jobs because of that. So here we are trying to like get this out here so people can just chill out basically and just perform and, and be happy. And we, I, you've probably seen the depression that comes along with it too within your patients. I've seen it. It's crazy. So I felt like we had another alternative for them, right? And now they're trying to take it away. And like, and that, and not, and not to get too political. Um, now, Dr. Sam in New Jersey, you're a little bit different because you know your patients have much more access to to solutions than, than Dr. Sam does here in Texas. But Texas actually has a current medical marijuana program. It's called the Compassionate Use Program. Um, it is, it is seen as kind of the laughing stock of medical marijuana programs in the nation. Um, essentially, you know, there's almost 30 million people in Texas, and right now, currently, a little over 5,000 people in Texas have access to this program. What they did is they, they capped the THC amount at um, five tenths of 1%, um, and so, uh, I'm sorry, half a percent, and so it's really, uh, it's like a nothing burger. I mean, you can take a half percent THC product and, and basically receive nothing from it, but it was kind of believed to be done. So um, leadership in Texas could say, look, we're compassionate. We care about kids with epilepsy, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but they basically created this plan that really does nothing from no, for nobody. They've made it very difficult to access a physician um, to even get a referral for this and, and then, you have to be a neurologist and if, if you do yeah. if you do get a referral then they make it very difficult to get your product so you can only get it in Austin it's very expensive um, and so so part of what we're seeing in Texas is this move towards this medical marijuana reform bill um, that goes to the house vote which which would be great uh, but at the end of the day 
both Lisa and I believe that the politicians ought to be out of it. It should be out of yeah. it. It should be between you and it's your patient. It's not about, and, and I, why should I have to be a neurologist to prescribe it? I know too, you know, Neuro- not just the brain, it's other things. I mean, right. New Jersey's uh, been pretty liberal with their medical marijuana program, and right now the debate is they expect a lot of demand with the recreational marijuana, and as you know, you can't ship marijuana you know, interstate, so everything that is sold in New Jersey has to be grown in New Jersey, and there's not enough supply yet, so that was that's a big thing. But, but in any case, the politics aside – one of the questions I wanted, I would want to know as a consumer is, um, so I, I have some idea what some of these different pain um, medications that we currently prescribe do for people. Typically, opioids will make people kind of sleepy. They may um, cause some nausea. They um, kind of get them loopy. Um, and obviously, there are major uh, you know, issues if, if too much is taken at one dose. You know, I, you know ibuprofen or an NSAID, um, can be very helpful with pain, but then if you take too much, it's going to rip up your stomach. You can cause gastro- gastritis. Um, so what are the general reports that people have when they take ingestible CBD? Do they have a sense of, um, you know, what are some of the general effects that you might expect to feel or see along with it in a acute pain um, uh, setting? And then what happens if you accidentally take, say, too much what, what could you also expect as a, as a patient? So there's, there's a lot of pain relief with it, and a sense, a, a more of a sense of relief. So it sort of takes your brain away from like worrying, 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 worrying. And then you just take it, and you can have a sense, not euphoria necessarily, but just a sense of just bringing it down. You can quiet in the noise. You bring the volume yeah, down. Yeah, it's almost like that, that stereo speaker knob mm-hmm. where you're just turning the just noise. Turn, like the pain may still be there, but you're not so like – oh my gosh, oh my gosh, and then you kind of get yourself worked up, and then you call Sam, and you're like, oh my God, I can't, whatever. And so, but that that's the goal, is to just turn the volume down for people. But I think, you know, that's why they're they're turning to all these alternative things, because that's not what happens. Like, with Vicodin, you're out. You do feel loopy. You can, even with one, I've had little bitty patients that are just out with one, or half of So what them. happens if you take too much, uh, you accidentally take... A ginormous dose. What what you might you expect? Move, nothing really. Nothing side effect wise. Nothing bad happens. You can have a little diarrhea. So those are some of the little things that can happen with it. Some people do get a little sleepy, but it's not like a THC sleepy where you're completely out. You don't remember anything. It's not like that. So, yeah, the, so. the greatest thing about cannabis in general, uh, but then CBD specifically, is no one has ever overdosed. There's never been a documented case of an overdose with a CBD or cannabis product. Ever. Um, and so... But there has been with opioids, right? Oh, yeah, right? yeah. So, 500,000 yeah. in, in 10 years. So since uh, 2009 to 2019, there was 500,000 opioid overdoses. And that's not okay. You know, so that's, that's what we're trying to... And it's, and it's interesting. Uh, we get a lot of feedback. Depending on, again, how much you take of a product will give you different results. A lot of people take very small doses of CBD, like in the morning, Um, we call it microdosing. So they'll take anywhere from like five to 25 milligrams in the morning, and they actually find it very uplifting. Um, They use it in substitution of of coffee, Um, but it makes them actually very alert. Yeah, but it makes them very alert um, without like caffeine jitters. And then they will begin to take larger amounts during the day, but especially in the evening time. Um, You know, a lot of people say that it makes you sleepy. I think... I think it makes you more relaxed than sleepy, so you're able to sleep at that point. Uh, but again, using the same product in two different ways can give you two different re- results. I know you're yes, fancy. biphasic. I don't. I can't. I don't yeah. know what that means. So but, you remember? Uh, yeah, biphasic is same product, different dose, different results. Same product, different yeah. results. So biphasic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and then well, uh, and, and we get uh, we get the question a lot: If I drink the whole bottle, will it make me high? And the answer is no. So remember, CBD is not psychoactive, even though it has trace amounts of THC in it. Even if I drink the entire bottle, once my receptors are full, it won't titrate in my in my body fast enough before I get rid of it. And so I, I could drink a gallon of it; it may make me sick to my stomach, but I'm not going to get high from it. But you don't have receptors to Vicodin necessarily, right? Like, and that's why people feel so. We don't. We're not Lexapro. We don't have receptors to Ambien. 
you know, the, all these medications, we just, our body doesn't know what to do with it. And it just, you know, we have the opposite effect. So, but I think there, obviously in plastic surgery, you do have a place for opioids. And that is coming from a person that has had it. Yes, there was a time that I needed it, and then to get off of it was the next thing. And then, but there was that, what else do you do? Right? So then, what else do you do ends up being something that we can help out with after that. So, yeah, and I, and I, I just, I think, okay. No, go go ahead, Trey. I don't want to. I don't want to. I was going to say, uh, actually, I had, spi I had spinal fusion done uh, late last year. Um, I did opioids for about two to three days post surgery, um, and I mean it was it was pretty significant. I had rods and everything put in, um, and then after two or three days of using opioids, I transitioned off and used CBD products exclusively. And again, I started at higher doses than what I normally take. Um, and then as I felt those symptoms relieving, uh, being relieved, then I started to kind of taper off and back down to my normal, my normal daily dose that I just take for, for wellness in general. But, but like your, your co-host, um, who's the doc again in, you had his knee scoped? Sal, Sal Pacello. Yeah. Yep, and Sal. So that would be a good one for post-op pain control would be the topical roller for his knee because when you have knee scopes, you know, the incisions are so tiny not like in plastic surgery necessarily where you have a big tummy tuck abdominal plasty scar. So with him, I would definitely say, hey, like do that roller on that knee because those incisions are so tiny and closed over that he would be a perfect example of how topical would work great. But I mean, it, I mean, every, everyone knows that, you know, the whole opioid thing, it's a huge issue. Uh, I was in Wichita Falls about three weeks ago um, and actually was uh, met uh, one of our well sale champions uh, and he finally kind of got the courage up to come talk to me. This guy is a retired Navy veteran. Um, he is a current first responder and a medical first responder. And he was suffering from neck issues and they got kind of worse and worse. And he finally had neck surgery done. They gave him opioids to, uh, to deal with the pain. And he kind of, you know, he got addicted. Um, and he kind of kept going back to get more and all of a sudden 30 days worth it only lasted four or five days and he made the decision to start buying opioids on the street that's what he, that he couldn't get out of bed otherwise and so here you have this navy vet you know this medical first responder who whose doctor just cut him off said hey i'm not doing it anymore but didn't give him another solution and now he's out on the streets you know buying drugs and, and this is happening all the time yeah and I mean, to the point where his wife caught him doing it and said hey you know if this ever happens again you know we're done and so he ended up having another surgery uh, that was supposed to give him two years of relief gave him about eight months and the pain started coming back and he said you know i was honestly really considering buying drugs on on, on the street again because i can't get out of bed i can't go to work and so he found cbd and began using it and he said, you know, day one, nothing. Day two, nothing. Day three, nothing. Day four, nothing. All the way to day seven. He said, day seven, I got out of bed and stretched and just realized, you know, holy shit, I just got out of bed. Um, because before this, his wife had to help him out of bed. And so, you know, he really credits having this alternative therapy to, you know, I don't want to be dramatic to say saving his life, but it saved his marriage. He didn't have to go back out and buy drugs on the street, but it gave him another option um, to deal with his pain, uh, you know, other than an opioid, which, you know, had the potential of used incorrectly to destroy his life. And so, again, I think it's all about giving people and giving your patients options. Um, you know, they're going to do it anyway. Yeah, for you guys, that, yeah, you guys yeah. need, you need those tools in the toolbox. And is CBD or THC the answer for everybody? Absolutely not. Lisa and I never say this is a miracle cure. You know, it's, it's not some panacea. Um, but it may be right for certain people. And, you know, again, it all comes down to giving providers those options. That's, Strong stuff. you know, yeah, that's really, that's really a powerful story. And, and I think what, what Sam and I and every other surgeon out there is looking for is alternatives to opioids for all the reasons that you guys are saying. And so, um, thanks so much for your insight today. I think, Everyone who's listening to our program should immediately go to Instagram at WellCellCBD because what's very clear listening to two of you talk is that I know less about CBD than I thought I did, um, but it's good to know there are people that actually know a ton about it. So with that, I want to thank you guys so much for being on our podcast. It's been, it's been a blast catching up, and I've learned so much. 
Yeah, thank you very well, much. Thank you for everything you guys do too, because yeah. you make women's lives different. You you change our lives too and give us our confidence back. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm a classic surgeon advocate for sure. <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys. Thank you very Take much. Take care.